Ready? Masu Yeshu Thanks guys Lechana Lechave Break it down now <laughs> Boots and cat Da da ne za be ya khle za khi ma pe now everyone doesn't know the words something 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 khanika is awesome and more bashi is more khanika ta mis be ya as a more bashi is more khanika ta mis be ya all right, we are live from South Africa, from Johannesburg, from the home of the Samuels. What an amazing hashkacha prati that I would end up in the country of the person who runs this year in the first place, and we could do it live while we're still haven't hit a second wave of Corona here. <laughs> Notice the things. So we're very excited to be here tonight, and we want to dedicate this year, first of all, to Mazal Tov. It's not just that we're at a special place for this year, but it was also the Bala Bites birthday today. So we want to give a special shout out to, okay, I wrote it down, Shmuel Ben Lea for Mazal Tov and continued health on Mea Ve'esrim. And also some other, sh some other shout outs tonight. We're going to dedicate this year to Sari Bat Meirav, to Gabriela Nechama Bat Miriam Aviva, um, and a mazel tov to Tamar Bat Miriam Shprinza Sara on her birthday. Mazel tov to our friends Eli Sheva and Natan on the birth of their baby girl. Shout out to Nina Levana Bat Sara in Miami. Uh, also for Michal Bat Gita. Uh, we are, and to everybody else, take this moment for yourself to dedicate this year to whoever you guys feel you want to dedicate it to in your heart, in your soul. Um, and also, we always thank JIC for hosting in general. And also thank you, Hashem, for bringing us to this moment. And please, Hashem, this is a massive day. We're on the seventh night of Hanukkah. It was just Rosh Chodesh Tevet when Parshat Miketz, which signifies, Miketz signifies the end. In other words, Mashiach is coming, please God. Um, so we're just, and it's like just jam-packed with awesome holy light. So, uh, you know, I'd like to just take a shout out also for Hashem that on this day where we're celebrating the Maccabim, did you guys ever know what the word Maccabi means? You do? Do you want to say? Hummus. It means? Hummus. Hammers, right. That's, that's one thing that it means, but also there's another idea that perhaps when the Maccabim were fighting their fight, that they had a flag, and this flag had the letters Mem, Kuf, Kaf, Bet, Yud, and Maccabi would actually stand for Mi Kamocha Ba'elim Adonai. That the Maccabis, that their whole anthem, the whole thing they wanted to spread is, wow, look at the Ribbon Shalom, look at this God that we have, that even while this army of thousands and thousands of men are coming to fight us, perhaps 70 dudes, Mi Kamocha Ba'elim Adonai, who is like you, O Hashem? Did anyone know that? I thought that's like the coolest Torah. Did you guys know that one yet? No, I, I also, did you know that? I, did you guys know that? They're on Facebook Live. Feel free to post in the comments. So that's kind of the theme for tonight, both all of the above, in Hanukkah, in Rosh Chodesh Tevet, in the Parsha, who is like you, O Hashem? It's basically, we're, we're trying to see Hashem through the difficult circumstances of our lives, right? And Rosh Chodesh Tevet that we just had today, Chodesh Tov, Tevet begins with the letter Tet, and Tet, according to Kabbalah and Chassidut, is the goodness hidden within. Tet as in Tov. But Tet, if you look at the shape of a Tet, it's, it's kind of like, let's say if I was a, can you kind of see what I'm trying to do here? It's like there's an opening and a space in between because even when the, the darkness conceals, there is goodness hidden within. Tet is also the, the, it's not the letter of the month, but it's very symbolic of what happens in the month. In fact, Tevet is one of the only months of the year where we can expect difficulty. Did you guys know this? It's, it's expected difficulty ahead, and that's why it's the goodness hidden within. That's also why the letter of the month is the Ayn, because it's how we see things. It's we can expect, you know, especially with the pan well, the pandemic or whatever you want to call it. Sorry to anyone who feels disrespected by that. No disrespect. But essentially things are getting crazier and crazier. And our job as Jews is really to find the hidden light with it. Actually, I didn't sleep last night. 
I just came from a beautiful ceremony um, for Tamara Gieber's birthday. And in this ceremony, it was a big mix of like Hasidic Jews and non-Jews covered in like tattoos and like this is their first time meeting a Jew. And so there was one particular woman who said that it was such a, in their words, Kiddush Hashem for coming to the ceremony and meeting Jews. We were singing songs all night long. It was super beautiful because apparently she had dated this Jewish guy who treated her terribly. And from then on, she thought Jews are just terrible people. And when she met this group of Jews that was singing all night long in a healing ceremony, she said, wow, is this to be possible that you Jews are actually those people that are holding the light for all the generations until the final day? And we're like, yeah. She's like, I couldn't believe it. But now that I've seen you, I see that through all the darkness that we've heard about Jews, that the truth is that you guys are just holding the light until it gets revealed. So it's our mission. It's what we're coming to do in this month. It's what we're coming to do through our seventh night of Hanukkah. Also, every night of Hanukkah, according to the Kiddushat Levi, has a special segula. And tonight's segula is spiritually the fixing of Shabbos, because it's the seventh night. And specifically, it's not just the fixing of Shabbos, it's the fixing of Shabbos through the Zmirot, through the Nigunim that we sing. So it's a very good idea now to have intention that this Shabbat, you put special effort into your zmira, into your nigunim. And I'll just tell you something extra special, beautiful about the Parsha before we even get into it, which is that, let's see, maybe I'll read it to you straight from the book. That um, it says, th this week's Parsha, by the way, is Miketz. In Miketz, we have Pharaoh's dreams. We have Yosef getting out of jail. We have the initial reunion with the brothers. Well, actually, it's the second reunion because now they've brought Benjamin down. And it's the reunion where Yosef is just about to lose it because he can't handle the emotion. He can't handle the emotion of being reunited with his brothers after all this time. But Rav Shlomo Karlibach says that it wasn't just the emotion of meeting with the brothers. In fact, what happened is, and if you haven't heard this, this is enough Torah for your whole year. It says that when Yaakov told his children to bring gifts down to Egypt, because they were going to meet the viceroy of all of Egypt. This is not a small deal. You know, who's, is there a president of South Africa right now? What's his name? Cyril. I can't pronounce that. It's okay. Cyril. Cyril. We call him Uncle Cyril. So. Uncle Cyril. So if you're going to meet Uncle, <laughs> Uncle Cyril, and, you know, you're, you're kind of threatened by the fact that he might not be into you, you want to bring a lot of gifts. So Yaakov tells the brothers, take from the gifts of the land to bring to the viceroy so that we'll appease him. Does anyone know which special gifts that Yaakov told his sons to bring? This is going to blow your mind. Okay, so listen, do you guys know? Listen to the words. Does anyone recognize the word zemer? Zemer is a tune, it's like a nigun. And that actually what Yaakov was telling the brothers, check this out, this is going to blow your mind. Bros, listen up my boys, I want you to prepare the most beautiful, beautiful songs from the Aretz, from Eretz Yisrael, from our people. I want you to take and I want you to learn the harmonies and I want you to practice them so that when you stand in front of the viceroy, you're going to have something to really melt his heart. Because think about it, the viceroy of Egypt, this guy is a multi, multi-billionaire, according to, the, to, to Chazal. They say the money he had was insane. Yosef worked on developing his palace for three years. Things were made out of pure gold. He had hundreds of servants at his, at, at his call at any point. What's going to impress him? If he brings some dates from Israel? He should bring some falafel? Like, what is going to impress a viceroy? Obviously not simple gifts, but actually zmirot. Nigunim, tunes. And so what happened in that moment when the brothers and Yosef unite later on in this Parsha, check this out, is that it was actually Shabbat. And not only was it Shabbat, but which meal on Shabbat do we have like a tradition to really sing? Third meal, Seudach Lishit. And that actually, tell me if you guys know this, because if you don't, you're just, you're just going to freak out, or I freaked out at the least. What, the, what happens is that when they actually have that famous meal with Yosef, that the brothers say, can we please share with you a gift that we brought from you, from our people, from our tradition. And there they go in ten-part harmony. And they start singing this multi-harmony, and Yosef at this point just loses it. 
like I said at the ceremony last night, there are these people who came in hating Jews. And what happened is when they heard us singing in harmony, beautiful tunes, actually, ironically, the tune that we were singing was from the rabbi that compiled this book, Rabbi Shlomo Katz. And they said, when we heard you singing, that was it. The hatred melted away. So holy cow, did you ever have this perspective? Can you ever imagine the brothers? Imagine your family, you haven't seen them in so many years, and you're in costume, and they walk in, and they sing the most be- I don't know, what's your most beautiful song? A lot of people think it's Le Mancha. You know that one? Le Mancha, Hashem Elokeinu. What's your most favorite song that brings you to tears in our tradition? I'm actually asking. People online, what's your most favorite song? Oh, Mumsies is Ya na 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 Hey Ya na 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 Ya ya na na Ya na 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 So imagine, Mumsie hasn't heard a Jewish song in 20 years, and then all of a sudden comes in a group of Chabadnikim singing this in harmony. What would be your reaction if you heard your? Does anyone know now your most favorite Jewish song that brings you to tears? Some people it's B'shem Hashem. Some people it's Achenu, right? If you would hear Achenu, and what what song would it take you? Um, I think for me, it's um, Eishet Chayil. Eishet Chayil. By Eitan Katz. By Eitan Katz. And if oh, Eishet Chayil, that one. Imagine, imagine. You haven't seen anyone Jewish. He hasn't seen anyone Jewish in all of these years. You would lose it. Has everyone been to a house, let's say in Israel or just here, where it happens to be a very musical house, and all the people are in harmony? Okay, so then we have to get you to come to Israel soon. <laughs> There's this one family on the former Shlomo Karlibach Moshe of the Solomon family, and everybody there is a musician. And also the Atias family, if anyone knows them. And when you go to their house, and so it's saying here actually that when Yaakov tells Yosef, to, the, the brothers, pardon me, to bring to Yosef Chum Mizmirata Aretz, that it wasn't the spices or the dates or the figs of Eretz Yisrael, but it was Nigunim. And it says here, can you imagine the way the holy tribes were singing? The way they were harmonizing? harmonizing? He says, now listen to this. It's Mamash, the saddest thing in the world. I'm sure Yosef HaTzadik was singing to himself all the time. But he had not heard his brother singing Shabbos de Melodies for so long. It had been the longest time since he had harmony. And at that moment he decided, I can't go on like this. I have to tell them who I am. And so eventually he will reveal, we're, we're kind of in a cliffhanger on this parsha where Yosef doesn't do the full reveal, but he actually does tell Binyamin in secret. But anyways, we'll get in. Um, okay, so first of all, hello. Do you need more Torah than that? Is that like, you going to remember that for your whole wide life? I don't know. I, it's, ah, it's very exciting. Guys, I didn't sleep. Maybe it's the, <laughs> maybe it's the cup of cola that's getting me so excited. So anyways, that in and of itself was so, so, so beautiful. But the reason is because singing in particular has a, par- has, has a way into our soul. Does anyone know where the original music came from? Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash. Do you, well, that's true. Do you know how many people would sing in the Beit HaMikdash? Yeah, do you know how many Levim there were at any given moment? So apparently 100,000 Levim were trained to sing at any given moment, but on any given day between 30 to 40,000 Levim would sing in the Beit HaMikdash. And this doesn't include the four to 5,000 instruments that were being played every day. So imagine now bringing your sacrifice. That is one of the original times where we had epic singing. But what's before that? Miriam, Miriam right? We had, when we left Egypt, we bust out into tremendous song. Song represents our freedom. What's before that? So before that, there's two places. So all of us heard unbelievable music at the beginning of our lives. Do you know where? In the womb. For any mothers in the house, when your baby is in your womb, it's hearing the most beautiful epic symphonies from heaven, from the angels. And even before that, when we're in heaven, it says that the angels are singing their song. And not only that, but the entire world is created through song. So song has a special way of tuning in to a deeper place. That's why, for example, if you, have heard, if you haven't heard a song since second grade and all of, someone's, all of a sudden someone sings it, you know it. Because song has a particular way of touching our heart. So why did I bring that up? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe, perhaps just because I think this, this epic moment in the reunion, it's brought together through song. And also the reunion of the brothers in this week's Parsha is not, it's not just any reunion, right? That the things that happen in the Bible, the things that happen in our history are the things that are going to happen 
to us and with us, both with the resurrection of the dead, right? Can you imagine those people that you've lost along the way? Do you think they're just going to come up out of their graves and you're like, hey, grandma, how's it going? No, I, I can't imagine the beautiful symphonies that we'll play when we come to hug the people that we've lost. When we come to reunite with everybody, you know, I was also explaining to the people in the ceremony, again, because it's not so often that I'm around so many non-Jews, what our whole tradition is about and that we're waiting for this great epic day and this great epic reunion. And they were like, really? That's what's going to happen? And it's like, yeah, this isn't just about the reunion of Joseph and his brothers. This is about the reunion that the reason we're still lighting Hanukkah candles is because we still have hope, because we still believe in a day where it's not just about the body, but that Hashem is going to bring it all together, Miketz, in the end of time, and we're going to be singing and dancing with everybody, with everybody in South Africa, you know, bringing their beautiful homes to Eretz Yisrael, with all the people, all my family in Los Angeles, they're going to come home. You know, only recently I started to pray for this final tikkun. I don't know if you guys pray for this. Do you ever pray uh, that all of your family should be reunited in Eretz Yisrael with everybody you've lost and everybody that's... Do you ever pray about this? I just recently started realizing, like, wait, why am I not praying for all of my family to be home together? The reunion in this chapter is about the great reunion. And can you imagine the great reunion of everybody you've ever lost, everybody you've ever missed? Does anyone in our family outside of South Africa? <laughs> Can you imagine, all of a sudden, you're all together. So this Parsha is one of tremendous hope. And I love when I look into the small details of the Parsha and I can extrapolate tremendous, tremendous hope for the future. I, I don't know, I just, I can only prod you so far to try to go there in your imagination of what it's going to be like, this great reunion. And it says also, you know, we're, we'll get there next week's Parsha, when he says, I am Yosef, that this is actually an indicator for what Hashem's going to say to us. Yo, peeps! I am Hashem. This whole time, through all the darkness, all the difficult things that happened to you, I've been here the whole time. So this is, everything that we're learning in the Parsha is a reminder of what's to come. Because it's very hard to relate. Egypt, famine, brothers that try to kill you, reuniting. It's very hard to relate. You know, does anyone here ever have dreams about seven fat cows and seven skinny cows? <laughs> no, I never had that dream, right? Say what? After you watch the Joseph, after you watch oh, then perhaps, right. But anyway, so I just, I love, you know, I just, we didn't even really start, but I wanted to tune in to, to that which is already there. And um, so, by the way, we're going to just do a little Hanukkah Torah first. Um, the idea, that, now I realize why I was telling you about song. It's because it's something that exists even before we're aware of it, that there's something happening in this world, in your lives, that was already planned before you even knew it, right? This idea that when we all come together and sing the great symphony for Mashiach, which, by the way, we know there's going to be a tenth and final song for Mashiach. Do you guys know this? That there have been nine songs throughout history, and the prophets predict a tenth. This is going to be this great epic song of Mashiach. So there's something about tuning into that which we already knew. And that's what I want to go into with Hanukkah. Sorry, it's a little like all over the place, but I'm so excited to present all this information, plus no sleep. So I'm just praying that Hashem brings it down well. So I wanted to bring a Torah for everybody from a South African, a famous, awesome South African rabbi uh, that I heard his year on Hanukkah years ago, and it touched my heart deeply. And that's why everyone here has a piece of paper and a pen. Uh, online, if you are watching, I really highly recommend getting out a pen and a paper in this moment. Uh, you could do it on your phone if you want, but I personally like the writing exercise because we're going to learn something from Rabbi Akiva Tatz. Ah, it's cool to be in South Africa and call out a South African rabbi. Okay, so l'chaim, l'chaim tovim v'l'shalom. Okay, so like this. It's brilliant, by the way, and please, God, I'll, I'll tag this year in the post, so if anyone wants to go to my Facebook page, you can see it yourself. But he says like this, okay? Um, Rabbi, so this is coming off of the idea that Yosef was telling, that Yaakov was telling the brothers, take from the song, and that the big reunion happened at third meal during song, and that song is something that happened before we were born and we identify with it. Okay, so now pause, going to take a detour, and we'll get back in. So Rabbi Kiyotat says that in all paradigms, in all paradigms, light is given and removed. So for example, uh, tell me, holy sisters, if you haven't met your Zivug yet, are you longing for him? Yeah, why? 
because light is given and removed. Before you were born, it was already called out who you're supposed to be with. That person is there waiting for you, right? But you long for them because the light was given and removed. Does anyone here long for the Beit HaMikdash? I, I do. Do you guys think about the, anyone online, you guys think about the Beit HaMikdash? Moms, do you ever think about the Beit HaMikdash? Right, so why do we long for this strange building? Because why? Light is given and removed. We already had it. Torah, does any, I mean, you're all here tonight. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Do you, ever, do you ever long for more Torah in your life? So why do you think you long for more Torah in your life? You never had it. You don't know. What, did you ever learn that thing? I don't know. You ever learned Masechet, this or that? I didn't. Why do we long for Torah? Where have we known Torah before? In the womb. Exactly. Light is given and removed. In the womb, we were taught all of this epic Torah. And then, poof, we come out and it goes. So in all paradigms, light is given and removed. And what Rabbi Kiva Tat says, is we have to work very hard to get it back. That we're not here for free gifts, but we're here to work hard. And if it was never shown to you, your zivug, the Torah, Beit HaMikdash, you wouldn't have even known that it was possible for you. You wouldn't have even known what could be. And he says that it is in that void that we come into our own. So he gives the following example. Um, I'd like to wipe my nose, <laughs> and my mother asks me on repeat not to do it with my hand, <laughs> so I'm going to grab a tissue <laughs> every week. She says, Niwi, why are you doing that? Does anyone have a tissue? No, oh, thank you. I just, you know, kibud M, no matter if I'm in the, oh, here we go. In the middle of a year, I still have to do it. I still have to respect my mama. There you go, mama. Look, I'm a prim, proper lady. <laughs> Hello. That's my mama. Okay, so he says, he quotes Rabbi Meir, and he says, imagine, okay, now I really want everybody to take this personally. Imagine I'm talking to you, and people online, please imagine that I'm talking to you. Okay, imagine, and here's where you need your pen and paper. Imagine that you could live for one day, for one day, as the person you could be if you worked on yourself for 20 years. 20 years, imagine you were given a gift, and the spiritual world opened up. You following, you following, you following? Don't mean to point, sorry. It said, and you could live for one day as the person that you would be if you worked on yourself from now in 20 years. Does everyone want to say how old that would be? I will be 57. 20 years. Think about it. You don't have to say it out loud. All right. 20 years. If you worked on yourself day and night, full adrenaline burn, full intensity, full tour learning, no TV, no nothing, just day and night working on yourself like crazy, full adrenaline burn, absolutely, totally intensely working on yourself, refining your character, building your learning for 20 years. And you could live like that for one day. So I ask you a question, okay? And everybody online, this is where you get your pens out. Who would you be on that day? And the answer is, I would be a person who, okay? So everybody, please take a moment and write down, but don't do modestly. Don't do like, I'd be a person who is very Torah learned. Like that's cute, but we're talking 20 years, okay? Without doubting yourself, I'd like to ask everybody to just take a moment and write down, who would you be on that day? I would be I would be a person who, okay? So go big, go, go big, don't, don't, uh, don't be shy. In 20 years, who would you be? I would be a person who, full adrenaline burn, and get creative as you like, okay? So just take a moment, I hope you guys are writing down. You don't have a pen, okay? Well, you will have to share pens. Who would you be on that day? I would be a person who, and if you don't want to write it down, think about it. Oh, I have a pen, here you go. So I'll give you an example. When I, first was, when I first watched this year, I did the exercise myself. And my first answer then was I would be a person who, anyone who was near me would realize how precious they were. That was like my big dream. If I had worked on myself so well that by age 57, you'd take, like we'd meet in the street and kind of like Rav Shlomo Karlibach, we'd meet and I'd look at you and you'd be like, oh my God, I'm so... I'm the most precious thing in the world. That's how, that's, that's, so that's just an example. But yours could be anything, okay? So everyone got something down? Everyone got, everyone uh, watching online got something down? I would be a person who, I'm going to ask for people to share. Is anyone ready to share? Anyone brave enough to share? <laughs> okay. Yeah? Um, so I'd be a person who is genuinely happy inside and outside myself, not jealous, never looking for foreverals or issues, healthily, mentally and physically, and even on that day, still looking to improve myself. 
Amen. Okay. Anyone, can I get anyone? I would really love it if anyone else shared. Sure, share part of it. I would be a person who? So it's actually something I'm like working on actively. Okay. But to be, so I would like to be someone who is so honestly themselves that other people feel like they can be themselves. Beautiful. The, the, this holy sister said she'd be so herself that other people could be themselves too just by being in her presence. Jody, do you know who you'd be in 20 years if you worked on yourself full of adrenaline burn? 18 books later? <laughs> 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 amazing that's amazing Gavin's perfect wife that's amazing okay I love it Isn't, I would really appreciate it if anyone shared and I'll, you'll explain you'll understand why afterwards would you share well I've been 93 yeah I would um, teach everybody how to look after their body Beautiful. She teach everybody how to look after your body. Okay, so here's the interesting news, and this is what I wanted, why I wanted to share with you this. Everybody has a different answer. Everybody has a different angle. I've done this exercise hundreds of, with hundreds of people, maybe not hundreds of times. Everybody has a different answer, and the reason is that the thing that you are longing for, the only reason you're longing for it, as we said with all other paradigms, is because that's who you are already. That's who you are already. That thing that you so long to be, the only reason you long for it is that's because that is who you already truly are inside. And what Rabbi Tatz is saying, that the reason that light is given and removed is because now in this lifetime, we have to have the courage and the tenacity to work back to that person who we truly are. That when Yosef heard those songs, he was waiting for that all of this time. When we have this desire for hope for Mashiach, for the Miketz, the reason is because it's already there. And this is a very inspiring message in my eyes because sometimes we feel like we're working all this time for nothing or who knows what's going to be. God wouldn't have put that desire in you unless you had the potential to fulfill it. And this is Rabbi Akiva Tatz's Hanukkah message that he says that the only reason you're longing for something in the first place is that's because you are who you already are. So I already am in potential a person who when I'm around other people, they know how special they are. And you are already that person who is like making the best out of every situation. You already have that ability. And you already are that person who, remind me because I haven't slept. Uh, that's comfortable, that's so comfortable in herself. That's so comfortable in herself. And, and from the little I know about you and your family, that is like your family motto. It's, what, it's the treasure you already have in you. And Jody, if that is your desire to be the perfect wife, it's because before you were even born, that mission was a possibility for you that all of the women of the world are going to look to you and say, wow, I want to do it. I want to do it like her. I want to do it like him. And you know, it's, it's very special because Rav Shlomo Karlibach said that it took us one couple to get us into this whole mess. All it's going to take is one couple to get us out of this whole mess. So all of us really have that amazing, unbelievable opportunity to to tune in to that thing that we're longing for. And it says that when we look in the light of the Chanukiah, that which you can see is the thing that you're really longing for. And then it helps align us and reorient us with our purpose for the rest of the year. That was a really cool, that was a really cool idea, isn't it? And who, who knew that that would come out just from learning that Yaakov told his sons to take tunes what are we like the Jewish jukebox you know like no there's something super deep in here is that when you want to remind someone of who they are well that's exactly it you remind them of that deeper part of themselves which they're longing for that thing that inspires them that is what they're really aligned with okay Whew. by the way Rav Riskin says about this Parsha that how did Yosef go from being in jail in the lowest of places to the highest almost the highest position of all times so this is very beautiful Torah he says that the, the way the trick right how was it what was it just Hashem just decided okay now you're in jail now you're out of jail now you're the lowest you're like you know it says that the prison of Potiphar was a dungeon underneath Potiphar's mansion that was like a big cave with only one light in the top and then there was all these other like dungeon cells around it so Yosef was really sitting in the dark for 12 years it's 
quite a long time to sit in the dark. Again, if you want to play with the age game, so if I'm 37 now, so that'd be, I'd only be out by 49. That's a lot of years to sit in the dark. And the reason I'm telling you this is because what Rav Riskin says, he says, how, what made that transition is that Yosef listened to the dreams of others. What actually got him out of jail was not his own dreams or Pharaoh's dreams, but actually that he took time to hear the dreams of another person and help them get there. So actually, I really love this Rabbi Akiva Tat's question because I think you can ask it of your friends and then help them see that thing in them, which is that which they truly are. Like, please go tell all your friends that that's your ambition because then they know. I'm sure your friends already know this about you, right? So, okay. So that's, I thought that's really beautiful and Hashem should help us listen to the dreams of the people around us so that we can help reorient them with that which they truly are. Right now, I know about Mumsy that she wants to help people really live embodied. I can see that in her and shine that back to her when she is shining. Okay, Whew. so far, just, uh, just a recap, because I, I love recapping what we learn. For me, with like undiagnosed 80 everything, it's like, oh, I don't know what I just heard until I hear it. So, so far we learned about the idea of what the Maccabim are. They're the people that walk through the streets holding the banner saying, Mi kamocha bailim Adonai. We learned about Tevet a little bit, about the goodness hidden within. Um, we learned about already it's this idea of Yosef coming down, I mean, the brothers coming down to Egypt and reuniting with that thing that Yosef was longing to hear, this beautiful tradition, this beautiful singing. We learned about the idea that Miketz aligns us with Mashiach, with the idea that we're all working for something. Ah, and yes, and like the people at ceremony says, like, really? You Jews are holding the light until the end of time? And like, yeah, really? Really, that's what we're still talking about, Miketz. That's what we're still talking about, this great reunion. And we learned about the idea that when you see something in the Parsha, it's not just a biblical story, but it's a, um, what's the word? Prelude? Pre precedent? It's a, it's a, a projection. It's a projection of what's to come is this awesome, great reunion that we could be excited about here in, well, anywhere we are. Okay. Now, part two. Is everyone okay? Yeah. yeah? Tuning in? All right, cool. Should we have stop and do a dance party? Just kidding. That's just what I say when I'm awkward. <laughs> so awkward. <laughs> you know, it's crazy to sit in front of a screen and know like a thousand people or later are going to check in and be like, oh man, I don't even know what I said. Okay, so let's go in a bit further in connecting to the Parsha. We're not going to have time to go through all of it, but maybe we'll just keep steiging all night long. Who knows? Okay, so I want to say another thing about Tevet that connects to the Parsha. Um, does anyone know uh, by any chance what the fixing of Tevet is? According to the Sefer Yitzira, which is a Kabbalistic book that apparently we inherited all the way in the Garden of Eden that's been passed down through the generations, we learn about the, the different the different um, like qualities of every month that we can tune into. And every month has a letter, a tribe, a, a color, a stone, and an actual fixing of our midot, let's say, that we're supposed to do. So does anyone know what the fixing of the month of Tevet is? So it's, it's a really important one. And it correlates to the fact that this is, you know, we're set up for, this might be a challenging month. Okay, so the fixing of Tevet is anger. Anyone else need to work on that? <laughs> Everybody! <laughs> right. Does anyone have Moroccans in their family? We wish you extra luck. We make you a l'chaim tom villa shalom. <laughs> right. Do you have Moroccans in your family? God bless you. <laughs> oh, geez, forget it. It's all over. Right. No, I'm just kidding. So the fixing of the month is anger, uh, which is really, it's really a beautiful thing. I don't know if you've ever done this. But to take the fixing of the month seriously, to put a note beside your bed that says, how can I, can, can I do anything different with my anger? Also, the letter of the month is ayin, which is indica indicative of how we see things, right? And that is often hand in hand with when we get angry. How did we see a particular situation, right? So now why am I bringing up anger in connection to the Parsha of Miketz? Can anyone imagine why I might be bringing up anger in the Parsha of Miketz? The Shvatim sold their brother. They didn't just sell their brother. They wanted to kill their brother. And, and we'll talk about this more next week, please, God. But they threw him into a pit of snakes and scorpions. Now, it could be that they didn't know because it was a very deep pit. In fact, between like about 30, what's 30 feet, 10 meters? 
about 10 meters. So apparently they didn't know, but this is very intense. Yosef should be getting very, very angry with them. And they should be getting very, very angry with this viceroy that's like treating them like a maniac, like a, one day he's loving them, one day he's hating them. So what's the deal here? How, what is, what's the idea of anger and Yosef and seeing? Can anyone put it together in their minds? What, how? He chose not to be angry. It's true, but do you know what his big trick was? Uh huh. Exactly. He said it wasn't their fault, and that it's from Hashem. And this is Yosef's whole deal. And again, I'll just revert back to the ceremony that I was just at. Um, the the we got a lot of positive feedback from the goyim, right? And they kept saying, "Wow, you guys are amazing. You guys are wonderful." That should not be where the conversation stops. The conversation stops at, thank you, Hashem, right? When we get complimented or when we get praised, oh, you're so amazing, thank you, Hashem. That it's turning back to Hashem both in the positive and when it's difficult. Now, my question for you is like this, and I would, I would encourage you to write something down again. At least I find when I'm learning things, when I'm writing actively, it helps me. So again, I encourage you guys online. Is there anything in your life right now which just seems like a balagan? just seems like a mess, just seems bad. It could be a financial situation, God forbid. It could be just something you're feeling d uh, despair about. It could be feeling stuck. Uh, any of these things, is there anything, any particular situation or relationship that you have right now that's been a bit difficult? I recommend writing it because the situation flips, right? So then the question, which is super simple, is what if you, like Yosef, truly saw this as completely from Hashem? It's such a basic tenet of our faith. It's what Hanukkah comes down to. But I really wonder, what would happen if you absolutely 100% believed that this was from Hashem? Would it change anything? Would anyone be willing to, to talk? It might move your anger from the person to Hashem. It might move your anger from the person to Hashem, which is a lot better of a place for the anger to go. Um, yeah, because it's not the person. The person that we're upset with is just a messenger. Are they? The, the, question, the question from the crowd was, but they're making the choice to be the messenger. I don't know. You know, one day last year, I had my wallet stolen. I was at the Shuk, and I was, uh, I was just like pointing to that thing that I wanted to buy, and I felt like a bump in my back. And immediately, I felt that like bad energy. You know, the, and, I, and I looked, and I saw my backpack was open, and my wallet was gone. And immediately, I was like, really, Hashem? Okay. Fine, so this guy needed to be the messenger to steal from me, and I needed to be stolen from. But I don't, he, you could say he chose to steal, but well, I think it's... Because if, if there was that thing on you for that to happen, exactly. it didn't have to be that person. Were, the thing would have happened regardless, yes. Beautiful. that person specifically chose to be Hashem Shaliyah in that situation. Well, I'm not sure that this one specific guy chose to be Hashem Shaliyah. He might just wanted my wallet, but... Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, okay, then. Nachon. Either way, they're the messenger. Either way, they're the messenger. So I just wonder, because all these concepts that are such simple concepts in Emuna, unless we take them personally, they're just like, oh yeah, Judaism says have faith. Oh yeah, Judaism says God's behind everything. But I don't think that if Yosef had that attitude, well, but you guys chose to, you guys chose to be the messenger. Like, I don't think that's what Yosef was saying. I don't think Yosef was saying, oh my dear brothers, you have officially chosen to be the ones to send me to Egypt. No. He just knew, he just understood that every single thing that happens in his life that Hashem made specifically for him, he saw it, understanding everything is from God, both the challenging things and all of this genius that he inherited. And from there, he could chill out a little bit. So does anyone else feel affected if they think about that one personal example in their lives where the, if they thought, if they fixed their eye to help adjust their anger, what would be if that most difficult thing in your life right now is absolutely from Hashem? Different. It's different. Even in the tiny things. I happen to have quite a big headache right now. So I'm like, okay, Hashem, I'm like, wow, this was absolutely meant to be that on this given night that I'd have to have a pounding headache. Okay, Hashem, thank you. I know it's for my best. You know, another beautiful thing that I read in this book is it says, uh, it's called Running the Show. 
And it says, Le flaot gdolot levado. He who does great wonders alone, from Tehillim 136.4. He says that the way that the Ribbono Shal Oilam runs the world is not to be believed. We always think that the Ribbono Shal Oilam is helping by getting us out of trouble, but friends, it's not true. The trouble itself is the way to the salvation. That's the way it is. Yosef HaTzadik would never have become king had he not been in prison. Do you see what it is the Holy Alexander Rebbe says? That God doesn't do miracles in the air. That miracles need someone to receive them. That miracles need the vessels themselves. That we are the vessels no matter what situation God is putting us in. He's literally setting us up. He's literally setting us up for the miracles that we're meant to receive. That is absolutely every single thing in this life is from Hashem. And I, I don't really, I don't want to give suggestions, but I would recommend, like, I've done this in my life, like, take a journal, write down the things that you think are, like, the worst and the suckiest. I have a friend that's a coach, and he always says to people online, okay, the way they start is, okay, what sucks in your life right now? Pardon my language, what stinks in your life right now? And from there, they can go into the work. But what if we also knew? What if we also really were like Yosef? and took every circumstance. I don't know. I like to put that out there as, a, as a something of supreme importance. Can I get any feedback? I feel so funny doing this all quietly by myself. Anyone, is this raising any thoughts in anyone's mind? Is this stimulating anything for anyone? Yeah, I think for me, because I think that what, what I've been experiencing is like maybe on such a surface level, like the, the two relationships that I'm having difficulty with that, that I'm thinking of when you speak about, um, in that moment, I'm like, I can't, can't believe they would say this, or I can't believe we're dealing with this again, or how is this happening, right. or is this real, right. you know, but I think that, like, when you realize that it's from Hashem, and I don't think that it's, that, like, it's necessary, so that, uh, you know, that, like, that something changes, but it's from Hashem, and it's for me to realize what to do with that. Okay, and let's go deeper. It's not that it's just from Hashem. What did Yosef say? I mean, it's actually in next week's parsha. but what's Yosef's attitude? It's not just that it's from Hashem. This is the absolute best thing that could happen to me right now. Absolute best thing that could happen to me right now. I'll be a little honest. I got a little bit sick at the ceremony last night. <laughs> and I had to leave the ceremony and, and, and uh, pardon me for getting graphic, but I had to throw up quite a few times. <laughs> Sorry. Americans were a little bit less tactful than South Africans. We just say boldly what's on our mind. And I had to realize that in that very moment, it's not just that the messenger is Hashem, that this thing needed to happen to me, but this is the absolute best thing that could happen to me in the moment. And that's how you get to the righteousness of Yosef, is that every day, in every moment, through the traffic jam, through the everything, these are simple concepts, but again, during Hanukkah, I think it's really important to be reminded of these simple, simple concepts. You are what you're longing for. The things that stink in your life are absolutely the best way God can realign you. And that the more we can see it this way, the more our anger diminishes. Because anger, as my teacher Moralea Golem says, do you know what anger is really saying to God? Yeah, you got it wrong. God, you got it wrong. I, this little tiny scrawny sack of bones and flesh with this lump of brain in my head that I use 2% of, I know better than you, God. You got it wrong. It wasn't supposed to be this way. And when I have that bit of arrogance so then i get upset and i get angry because i think i'm wrong i'm right and god's wrong <laughs> but it's a very big humbling process which is why yosef while working on his anger could also be so extremely humble what if this thing was exactly from hashem and what if this was absolutely the best thing for me okay Actually, if I could share something. Yes, I please. Think, it's the quote on my phone. Oh, yeah. It says, if you see darkness in the world, you're the one who needs to bring the light. It's by Shlomo Kalabach. Yeah. Shlomo Kalabach. And I think that maybe what I'm understanding, what you're saying, like connecting it to Hanukkah, is that like, you know, I spoke in the beginning about um, Rabbi Kiva Tats and how th there's been light before and then it was taken mm -hmm. away, but that's how we long for that light. And we're discussing this in Hanukkah. Maybe the whole point of Hanukkah is to say to us that, when we're in these moments of aggravation or frustration or things aren't going away, what is ultimately bringing the light to saying, this is from Hashem, and this is the absolute best thing? Because that is bringing that light into that situation. That's lighting the Hanukkah candle. Exactly. That's continuing the hope. That's living the miracle. 
And this is said from somebody that I have a miraculous connection with that I haven't seen in years and showed up tonight. So there's a lot of miracles. Absolutely, that's what's happening. So the, yes, so it's, yes, exactly it's that. And it's believing and knowing that God has a plan the whole time. Even this whole corona business, like what God isn't behind all of this, God isn't planning exactly the way for everybody to start making the perfect changes in their life. So on this note, I want to share a Hanukkah miracle, a personal story uh, that really helps indicate to me that God is behind everything. So the story goes like this. 13 years ago, I was a courageous young 20-something, and I decided to follow in my mom's footsteps. My mom was involved in the original Aliyot of the Ethiopians to Israel back in the 1980s. I was actually born, and then she left the house. <laughs> Good luck, Dad. Take care of the four kids and the baby, right? And she left Ethiopia to help organize the original Aliyot. Now, earlier in my life, I was very much into traveling. I really, you know, wanted to see everything in the world. Thank God I did that before Corona. <laughs> And uh, I decided to take a journey to Ethiopia to work with the people that were still left in the community. And it was awesome. And then once I was there, I decided, well, well okay, it was in fact planned for a year on the east coast of Africa. And I had a beautiful experience in Ethiopia. And then I went to go teach in the emerging tribe called the Abu Dai in Uganda. And I went through Kenya on this road called the Road to Hell, where you, like some guy actually broke his arm because the road is so bad. For anyone who's driven in African roads, you can uh, you know, get it. I got to go down to Tanzania and Malawi and Mozambique. At the time, I thought I was just going to stay in East Africa. But at the time, I had a little bit of a stir in my heart for something Jewish. I was not religious at all at that point uh, and I decided well you know what I hear that there's Jews in South Africa that's all I knew I heard there's some Jews in South Africa and I knew about this thing called Chabad but I didn't really know what it was uh, but I heard they help Jews so 13 years ago I'm in Mozambique and I'm calling from a payphone to this Chabad person and I said, hi, can I come over? And the reason I needed to come over is because I was actually planning to buy a motorcycle. I wanted to now take a motorcycle from Pretoria to Durban and around the coast of Cape Town. This is a brilliant idea. I was very excited. And so I said, but I need to buy my motorcycle. And it's in Pretoria, so I need to stay somewhere in Joburg. And I'm, the truth is, <laughs> I ended up staying accidentally in a brothel my first night in Johannesburg, at which point I realized this was bad news. <laughs> really, once there was like an hourly rate on the wall, I was like, I got to get out of here. This is really serious. So I called Chabad. I said, can I come over? And they said, sure. Uh, but are you Jewish? I said, yes, of course I'm Jewish. <laughs> Who knows? So I ended up staying there, not for one night, but for three weeks. And they ended up taking me, they ended up putting out cakes every morning and taking me to Rabbi Ari Shishler Shirim. And I was tasting Kabbalah for the first time in my life. And then it came two days, and it came three days. And three weeks later, I had learned so much Kabbalah that my mind was absolutely blown. And I, something inside of me is like, oh, I want this. And then I was going to continue this epic journey after I hit Cape Town to India. This is very exciting. This is going to continue my journey. And the Rebetzin, Re, uh, Rebetzin Yafa Libro, for anyone who knows the Libro, looks at me and she's like, honey, you are not going to India. You're going to Mayano at a seminary in Israel. I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to India. And she says, honey, you're going to Mayano. And I said, no. Three weeks later, I had packed my bags to go back to LA to get my stuff and to go to Mayano. And that was 13 years ago. And I, hadn't, I, I have never, except for travel, left Israel. And just this last Shabbos, on this spontaneous trip uh, to South Africa, I had the opportunity of reuniting with the Libras and telling them this whole story that one day when I wasn't religious and I was trying to buy a motorcycle, they ended up letting me crash. And because of a few cheese toasts and a few Kabbalah classes, I ended up making my way to Israel. And 13 years later, I'm here teaching Torah in the place where I was mekarev. And I hadn't seen them this whole time, so we had a fabulous reunion. So why did I bring up that story? First of all, because it's special. Um, but second of all, because God has a plan the whole time. You know, there I was just thinking I needed a place to stay, and my entire life got rerouted for the good. You know, at that time, it was very frustrating. I wanted to go meditate in India. <laughs> why are they sending me to a seminary? <laughs> You know, I was a young girl. I was like, there's not even boys here. Like, what are they doing? <laughs> this is a very stupid idea. <laughs> but thank you, Hashem. Hashem had a plan the whole time. So my bracha for all of us, you know, it's funny. I absolutely studied for perhaps 10 hours this parsha. I said nothing that I intended to say. I didn't even present the, I didn't even present actually what happens in the parsha so much. 
but maybe someone here needed to hear any of those messages. And so I just want to bless us in this Hanukkah light, where it's kind of hard to tune into Hanukkah because we're all separate and alone, uh, that we re-recall some of these ideas, that as we light that light of Hanukkah, both tonight and tomorrow, that we that we are able to bring back into our lives that last Shabbat. You know, also the, the tribe of this month is Dan. And Dan was the last tribe that traveled in the desert, and their job was Hashavat Veda. It was returning all the things that the tribes dropped. You know, with three million people traveling through the desert, there must have been some pacifiers left behind or some things. And Dan's, Dan's job, this is the tribe of this month, was to return all the lost things. And if you actually look at the words Hashavat Aveda, it's actually also Hashabbat Aveda, the lost Shabbos. And that what we're doing in this month is returning to ourselves all of that light of Shabbat that light of the seventh night of Hanukkah that we're sitting here in, that light of all those places that I gave up hope on myself, now that I can see just because I'm longing for them actually means it's a part of me and that if I have the tenacity, I can reach those places. And that in this night of Hanukkah, that not only do we go for what we're longing for, but when we're off track or when we're upset or when we're angry, can we stop and realize that Hashem was planning, Hashem is planning our Yeshua through all of this, through all of these challenges. So I bless us to, 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 to manifest those dreams we're longing for in ourselves, to reorient our ayin, our eye, to look at the things that are upsetting us and realize it's all from Hashem, that He has a master plan. And please God, tonight, before we even can hit our beds, that we should head to the temple for the final reunion. And just as Yosef is reuniting with his brothers, that we should also reunite with everybody, with compassion, with joy, uh, and with uh, the spirit of the Maccabim knowing Mika Mocha by Lima Donai, just like Yosef, who is like you, O God, who's been planning our salvation this entire time, who had all of our hidden blessings and treasures within us the whole time. So, yeah, happy Hanukkah. Can't wait to dance with you guys. Thank you for listening. And uh, Hanukkah Sameach. See you next, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Man. That, how much more do you need than take from the, that stinking of the Sudachli sheet? That adds everything to me. I don't know. All right, peace in, y'all. You don't think it streamed? Well, then it didn't stream, and then Hashem knew exactly what was going on.